Well, imagine the scene. The year is 1521. A simple monk is escorted by armed guards to the palace for his trial. It's incredibly intimidating for him. In front of him, sitting on an elevated chair, sat Charles V, the Holy Roman Emperor, uh, the most powerful man in the Western world. And the rest of the room was filled with great men, right? Princes, lords, papal envoys. It was 6 p.m. It was just getting dark. The flickering torches on the wall, wall caused flashes uh, to, to uh, shine off of the weapons and the armor of the guards that surrounded the room. And then the voice of the imperial lawyer boomed through the room addressing the monk. Pointing to the table in front of him where there was a collection of books, he asked, are those your books? And when he affirmed that they were, he asked, will you recant what you have written? If he refuses to recant, theoretically, uh, he'll be given enough lead time to get out of town before the death sentence uh, comes, uh, goes into effect, and anyone who finds him would be legally uh, okay to kill him. If he, if he does recant, he will be abandoning the biblical truths and the gospel that he had rediscovered after centuries of neglect. His response... Unless I'm persuaded by the testimony of the scriptures or clear reason, then I cannot and will not recant because it is neither safe nor right to go against conscience. Here I stand. I can do no other. God help me. After his confession, the guard shouted to the flames. And Charles, however, uh, allowed the monk to leave with safe passage as he had been promised. And of course, I'm talking about Martin Luther, one of the great reformers of the Protestant Reformation in the 16th century. And Luther's statement that he was compelled to believe what was taught in the scriptures expressed one of the grounding foundational principles of the Protestant Reformation as a whole, summarized by this phrase, sola scriptura, right? Scripture alone. Scripture alone is the ultimate authority for the Christian life faith, and practice. But not only is Scripture our highest authority, our engagement with the Bible is the means by which God's Spirit transforms our lives for God's glory. God's Spirit takes God's Word and applies it to our hearts so that we're changed to be more like Christ. And the concept of reformation occurs throughout the Bible, Old and New Testaments as well, all, as well as throughout history. Scripture itself repeatedly tells the story of God in covenant love directing his people back to his word and to the proper worship of him. And, and one of the most significant reforms in the Old Testament comes in our passage for today, Nehemiah chapter 8. Uh, but before we get to that, we need to pick up the story where we left off, back in chapter 7. And so you can find that on page 387 in the Blue Bibles in front of you, uh, if you would like to grab one of those. Uh, most of chapter 7 is the genealogy of the original returnees from Babylon back to, uh, to Jerusalem that was recorded for us in Ezra chapter 2. It's virtually the same exact genealogy, and Nehemiah is merely, he found that list, and he's copying it in his own record of what was happening in his day. So I preached a, um, a sermon on Ezra 2, so I'm not going to recapitulate that. I'm not going to do that again, and in fact, I'll skip over a lot of the chapter. I'll skip over the genealogy as we read it. So we'll begin in chapter 7. Jump to the end and read chapter 8 together. So if you're able, please rise for the reading of God's word. This is the word of God. Nehemiah chapter 7, starting in verse 1. After the wall had been rebuilt and I had set the doors in place, the gatekeepers, the musicians, and the Levites were appointed. I put in charge of Jerusalem my brother Han Hanani, along with Hananiah, the commander of the citadel, because he was a man of integrity and feared God more than most people do. I said to them, the gates of Jerusalem are not to be opened until the sun is hot. While the gatekeepers are still on duty, have them shut the doors and bar them. 
also appoint residents of Jerusalem as guards, some at their posts and some near their own houses. Now the city was large and spacious, but there were few people in it, and the houses had not yet been rebuilt. So my God put it into my heart to assemble the nobles, the officials, and the common people for registration by families. I found the genealogical record of those who had been the first to return. This is what I found written there. And then verses 6 through 73 is essentially this copy and paste from Ezra chapter 2. We'll skip uh, to the end of uh, verse 73. Uh, The priests, the Levites, the gatekeepers, the musicians, and the temple servants, along with certain of the people and the rest of the Israelites, settled in their own towns. When the seventh month came and the Israelites had settled in their towns, all the people came together as one in the square before the water gate. They told Ezra, the teacher of the law, to bring out the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded for Israel. So on the first day of the seventh month, Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, which was made up of men and women and all who were able to understand. He read it aloud from daybreak till noon as he faced the square before the water gate in the presence of the men, women, and others who could understand. And all the people listened attentively to the book of the law. Ezra the teacher of the law stood on a high wooden platform built for the occasion Beside him, on his right, stood Mattathiah, Shema, Ananiah, Uriah, Hilkiah, and Mesiah. And on his left were Pediah, Mishael, Milkajah, Hashem, Hashbadanan, Zechariah, and Meshulam. Ezra opened the book. All the people could see him because he was standing above him, and he opened it. The people all stood up. Ezra praised the Lord, the great God, and all the people lifted their hands and responded, Amen, amen. Then they bowed down and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. The Levites, and list 13 more of them, instructed the people in the law while the people were standing there. They read from the book of the law of God, making it clear and giving the meaning so that the people understood what was being read. Then Nehemiah the governor, Ezra the priest and teacher of the law, and the Levites who were instructing the people said to them all, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people had been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. Nehemiah said, Go and enjoy choice foods and sweet drinks and send some of those who have nothing prepared. This day is holy to our Lord. Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. The Levites calmed all the people, saying, Be still, for this is a holy day. Do not grieve. Then all the people went away to eat and drink, to send portions of food and to celebrate with great joy, because they now understood the words that had been made known to them. On the second day of the month, the heads of all the families, along with the priests and the Levites, gathered around Ezra the teacher to give attention to the words of the law. They found written in the law, which the Lord had commanded through Moses, that the Israelites were to live in temporary shelters during the festival of the seventh month, and that they should proclaim this word and spread it throughout their towns and in Jerusalem. Go out into the hill country and bring back branches from olive and wild olive trees and from myrtles, palms, and shade trees to make temporary shelters as it is written. So the people went out and brought back branches and built themselves temporary shelters on their own roofs, in their courtyards, in the courts of the house of God, and in the square by the water gate, and the one by the gate of Ephraim." The whole company that had returned from exile built temporary shelters and lived in them. From the days of Joshua, son of Nun, until that day, the Israelites had not celebrated it like this, and their joy was very great. Day after day, from the first day to the last, Ezra read from the book of the law of God. They celebrated the festival for seven days, and on the eighth day, in accordance with the regulation, there was an assembly." This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that your word transforms lives. Lord, thank you that your word is what brings renewal in our lives. And so, Lord, as we consider this part of your word, speak to us by your spirit. Um, Lord, help us to not merely understand, but help us to, uh, uh, to respond to what you would say to us today. Through your word, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. 
Well, the passage starts out by describing how Nehemiah arranged for the security of the city. If you remember last week, they had enemies all around them, enemies outside of Israel on every side, and even people within the people of God, Jews themselves, that were compromised with some of these folks that had made oaths to some of their enemies. And so there was still a a current threat in the city, but having rebuilt the walls, Having put people in place to secure the city, Nehemiah's work is not done yet. Now he has opportunity not just to rebuild the walls, but to help rebuild the people of God. And so in verses 4 and 5, we learn that the city is large and spacious, but pretty much empty. There's just not a lot of people there, and the houses haven't been rebuilt. And so uh, Nehemiah decides that Jerusalem needs to be repopulated, but not just with anyone, especially in light of all the enemies that surround them. It would make no sense to build the walls and let the enemy in. And so uh, it needs to be repopulated by people who were committed to God. People who would pursue holiness as God intends, who would see themselves as set apart from the nations around them for the worship of God, ultimately for the good of the nations around them as they represent God to the world. And so Nehemiah registers the people, and he does that in light of the genealogical record that came with the original returnees um, that uh, we found in Ezra chapter 2 in the previous book. Uh, They want to ensure that those who relocate actually belong to Israel. And as I said, verses 6 through 73 is a copy of that original genealogy from Ezra chapter 2. Well, what can we take away from this? I think uh, there's probably several things, but the thing that comes to my mind is that it's important for the church to know who belongs to the people of God, who are members of the church. Right? One of the ways that we do that, it's not the only way, but an important way we do that is through church membership. Of course, we recognize that everyone who professes faith in Christ is part of Christ's church, capital C. But in light of the commitments that the Bible holds out for the people of God to one another to make, and in light of the responsibility Jesus gives leaders within the church to shepherd specific people, It's important to know who has identified with God and his people here, right, in this local church. Of course, everyone is welcome, right? Everyone is welcome. Uh, We invite everyone to worship God, to consider the word of God. We open our doors literally and metaphorically to anyone interested in knowing God. But elders are held accountable to God for how they shepherd the believers under their care They need to know who their people are. And members are called to submit to their leaders. They need to express their intention to do so. If you wanted to join the people of God in Nehemiah's day, you would have to separate yourself from the nations and become a Jew. And there were ways to do that. There were provisions in the law for that. And in fact, both Ezra and Nehemiah in their respective books indicate some from among the nations who did just that. Um, if you want to be part of God's people today, what you need to do is recognize that God is your creator, that he is holy and you have sinned against him. And, And because of that, you deserve to pay the penalty for your sins, which is separation from God. But the good news is that what Jesus has done through his life and death and resurrection from the dead, if you confess your sins, God will forgive you pour out his grace on you, give you an inheritance among his people. You'll be saved as part of God's people. And a church member is simply someone who professes their faith in Christ and intends to honor Jesus and follow him and commits to doing so with these people here in this place in a local church. And so like Nehemiah, we want to know who is part of God's people and who is not so that we can encourage those who are and invite those who are not, right? If you're not part of God's people, if you haven't come to faith in Christ or identified with his people, uh, you can be reconciled to God. You can join with his people simply by trusting Christ, by turning away from your sin. You turn away from alternative explanations that the world offers 
about your life and your problems and your, your struggles. You learn from the Bible. You join God's people in this great cause to glorify God and enjoy him and make him known. It's a cause that is bigger and better than rebuilding walls around a city that lies in ruins. The great call that he gives his people today is to build up the body of Christ until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ as each one of us does our part. I'd love to talk with you after the service or some later time if you'd like to learn more about what that looks like. So the first thing Nehemiah does is to identify the people of God. Who are they? Whose are they? Let's consider second, hearing the word of God. Hearing the word of God. They completed the wall in the sixth month of the year. And the seventh month is one of the high points of the the Jewish calendar uh, for the Jewish people. It begins with the festival of trumpets. Today, uh, we call that Rosh Hashanah on the first day of the seventh month. It includes the Day of Atonement, today's Yom Kippur on the 10th, and the Festival of Booths or Tabernacles on the 15th, which lasts for a week. Deuteronomy and Leviticus, uh, two books from the Law of Moses, were to be read to the people during these festivals. And so on the first day of the month, all the people in the city and the surrounding countryside came together as one. They assembled in this large open square in front of the water gate, So Ezra can read the law to them. And verse 3 summarizes the day as a whole. And then it goes into more detail in verses 4 through 12. It fills in the details. And what we see as we we piece together this scene is that Ezra ascends on this large wooden platform that was built for this purpose to read the law before the assembled people. And he's flanked by 13 of the most prominent Levites uh, of the community. He opens the word of God, the law of Moses, in verse 5. And as he did so, all the people stand up to honor God's word. And we just did that in our worship service. We do that each week. But it's important for us to realize that with all of these external actions and postures that we may do in the Christian life, including standing for the reading of God's word, um, here this is a description of what they did, not a prescription. Okay, What's the difference? Uh, it explains what the people did to honor God's word, but it's not a command for all of God's people everywhere to always do that. Standing up is an appropriate thing to do to honor God's word, but standing isn't the point, right? You can stand for the reading of God's word and dishonor God by not listening carefully to his word and and, and trying to apply it and live it out in your life. And so the point is not the external action. The external action is intended to remind us of the, the importance of what we're doing, the importance of God's word so that we'll listen closely We'll repent of sin where the Spirit convicts us through the Word. We'll trust in the gospel. We'll seek to obey what we hear, what we read. And so after the people stand, Ezra begins by prayer. Verse 6, he leads the people in prayer and he leads the people in heartfelt worship of God. They focus their hearts and minds on God in worship, in relationship as they, as they postured themselves to hear what God would have to say to them. We love the Bible because it reveals God to us. That's what makes the Bible precious. We don't worship the Bible. We worship God. And we receive the Bible as God's word to us, right? And so Ezra then reads from the law of Moses, and he reads for about six hours. Now, some of you... Um, some of you read for hours in public reading of Scripture a few months ago. I don't know if anybody read for six hours straight. Um, that's a long service. Uh, are you ready for today? Because <laughs> <laughs> Yet, yet, verse 3, despite how long it was, verse 3 says, all the people listened attentively to the book of the law. They listened attentively They were focused, 
right? They did the hard work of listening actively, of paying attention, right? Do you do that when the word is read and preached? Do you honor the Lord by your close attention to his word? Do you listen carefully for the sake of your own soul? Listen to how the Westminster Larger Catechism instructs us to listen to the preached word. This is from the Larger Catechism, question 160. The question is, what is required of those who hear the word preached? In other words, what's your job during the sermon? And their response, it's old language, but, but, but follow along with it. It says... It is required of those that hear the word preached that they attend upon it with diligence, preparation, and prayer. Examine what they hear by the scriptures. Receive the truth with faith, love, humility, and readiness of mind as the word of God. Meditate and confer of it. Hide it in their hearts and bring forth the fruit of it in their lives." Right? There, that's the attitude and intention that we all should have when we gather for corporate worship and sit under the preaching of God's Word. <clears throat> Think about some of those terms that the catechism uses. Diligence. Right? Diligence is careful work. It's persistent effort. Do you listen passively and kind of pick up some thoughts that kind of stick, um, statements here and there, or do you work to listen carefully to the Word preached? Preparation is one of the words it uses. Come, ready to listen. Not just listen to the sermon, but to engage God in worship, in spirit, and truth. You know, maybe you have a pen and paper on hand and jot down some notes that strike you so that you can discuss it with your family or your friends later, or to remind yourself of application that you want to make. Prayer is one of the things it commends to us. You can pray for the preacher. He needs it. Uh, yourself, the congregation, pray that God's Spirit would teach and apply God's Word to our hearts. And then it, it has statements like receive the Word, meditate on the Word, talk about the Word, and apply it so it bears fruit in your life. This is the posture that God's people are to have as they sit under the preaching of God's Word. We would all do well to take the larger catechism to heart on these points, and if we do so, we will be following the example of the Israelites in Nehemiah um, during their day when God renewed them under Ezra, Ezra's ministry. Well, as Ezra read, 13 other Levites made sure everyone understood what was being read. Look at verses 7 and 8. The Levites, these additional Levites, instructed the people in the law while the people were standing there. They read from the book of the law of God, making it clear and giving the meaning so that the people understood what was being read. Now, it's, it's not entirely clear how all this worked together. As Ezra's up on the platform reading the law, uh, it may be that these people helped people who had trouble hearing. Uh, it's possible that they might have been involved in some kind of translation because they're reading from Hebrew and the people that came back from exile uh, primarily spoke Aramaic, a, a dialect of Hebrew. They may have provided quick words of clarification without disrupting the actual reading of the law by Ezra. It's not entirely clear, but uh, regardless of what the, exactly they did, the intent of what they did is crystal clear. They ensured that the people understood what was being read. The people understood what they were hearing from the Word of God. A word of application for us here. You know, this is, um, this is why we read extended passages of Scripture in worship. We value the Word of God. The Word of God is intrinsically valuable. Um, it's not set up for the sermon. The scripture is God's Word. And God's people are to be exposed to it, not just in snippets, not just in quotes out of context, not just as proof text to support the point the preacher wants to make. Paul tells Timothy, a pastor of the church in Ephesus, to devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture right? and to teaching and to preaching. 
So when we do our annual public reading of Scripture, where we read through the entire Bible uh, from Wednesday morning through Saturday at lunch during Lent, this is an expression of this commitment to devote ourselves to the public reading of Scripture. But we don't just do this once a year, right? That, that commitment uh, that we do during that season, public reading of Scripture, symbolizes the priority that we want to place on the Word all the time, every Sunday as we gather second application from this section. This is why we preach primarily expository sermons. Expository preaching, that's a strange word, but but basically what it means is that we focus on explaining a specific passage of Scripture in its original context so we understand what it means as we try to then make application to our own lives today. The goal is that you would understand what the Bible says and means in any given passage of Scripture that we're talking about that morning, as well as how it applies to us. As the people heard the law read, as they heard it explained to them, it stirred up sorrow for their sin. I don't know how you feel about that. uh, I've I've had conversations with people in the past who who, you know, we're frustrated that, that when they come to worship and they hear the word preach, that it always, you know, we always talk about sin. <laughs> That's just negative. That's kind of a downer. Um, but verse 9 describes how they begin to weep as they listen to the word. The law convicted them. That's one of the things that it does. And that, of course, is a good response to God's word in general. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, this very famous passage about the the Word of God, what it is and what it's good for, it says all Scripture is God-breathed, right? It's, It's inspired by God. It's the Word of God through people who write it down, and it's useful for teaching and rebuking, for correcting, for training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And so, The purpose of the Word of God is is not only to give us instruction and training, but it's also because we're sinners all in process, none of us have arrived yet to glory, we need God's Word to rebuke and correct us as well. It's one of its purposes. Uh, That's not a negative thing. That's actually for our good because it's only as we recognize our sin, confess it, and repent that transformation happens in our lives. Our vision as a church is to to join God in bringing life-changing transformation to individuals, families, and communities wherever we live and serve. Life-changing transformation suggests change. We're not there yet. We're in process. We need our minds and our hearts renewed. We need to apply God's Word in specific ways to, to grow, to be different people than we actually are today. But interesting, uh, before I say that, um, that's why we have renewal after every sermon, right? There's this opportunity, having heard the Word of God read, having heard it explained through a sermon, we have the opportunity to then respond to God ourselves, personally, silently, every week, sometimes through corporate confession, just responding to God's word, whatever he would say to us. And much of the time, that is a recognition of the gap between who we are and where he calls us to be. And so we confess our sins. We're honest to the Lord and we experience his forgiveness and his renewal and his grace and his commitment to us in the gospel. And then we move forward, endeavoring to live for Jesus better today than we did yesterday. Right? That's the purpose of gathering as an assembly in God's presence for corporate worship. It's one of them. Interestingly, the leaders encourage the people to stop weeping, (laughs) at least for now. There will be time for repentance later. They'll deal with the conviction they feel for their sins next week in chapter 9. But for now, this is a feast day. This is a high holy day of celebration. They're to be encouraged to joyfully celebrate God's provision for them, God's deliverance of them, God's relationship with them. And so Nehemiah tells them in verse 10, do not grieve for the joy of the Lord is your strength. God is full of joy for his people. 
It was God's good pleasure to move the heart of Cyrus to allow the people to return to the land. It was God's good pleasure to send Ezra and Nehemiah to lead the people in rebuilding and renewing. God delights over his people. God dances and sings over his people. God delights in saving us from our sins. God delights in adopting us into his family and renewing us more and more into the image of Christ. It's because of God's love that he sent his son into the world, not to condemn the world, but to save the world. Whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. It was because of the joy set before him that Jesus endured the cross despising its shame for the benefit of his people. And friends, because we experience the love and grace of a happy God, we are happy people. Have you experienced the difference it makes to know that almighty God rejoices over you as, as, as a believer in Christ? How would internalizing that reality help you deal with disappointment at work or at school? How would it help you have joy through present suffering, knowing that there's an eternal inheritance by a loving God who delights in you and that awaits you? The feast that they celebrated then, there were all kinds of opposition and struggles They're going to continue to sin, and yet they're feasting in God's presence in light of what God has done and what God promises to do. Their feast then, the moment-by-moment experience of God's presence that we have today, all of that points forward to a greater feast to come, the wedding feast of the Lamb where God and his people will, will fellowship together with no sin, no opposition, no injustice, no problems in the world. That's our hope. And so the people end the day with a great celebration. And the next day they come back for more. Verse 13, on the second day of the month, it started on the first day of the month. Now we're on the second day. The heads of all the families along with the priests and the Levites gathered around Ezra the teacher to give attention to the words of the law. In other words, Ezra was asked to give daily readings We might say that the heads of the families made a commitment to join in regular, systematic Bible study. And then they went back and they passed on what they learned to their families, their children, parents. Do you engage in Bible study for your own spiritual good? And also so that you can be the primary disciplers of the children that God has entrusted to you. That's God's model. That's what's happening here. He he instructs us, and then he sends us to instruct others, beginning in our own homes. Because it's the seventh month, on that particular day, Ezra takes them to the place in the law that describes what they're supposed to do in the seventh month. And so that takes us to celebrating the works of God, point three. Celebrating, yeah, don't sing hallelujah yet, we're not done. (laughs) Celebrating the works of God. Um, The text focuses on the Feast of Booths or the Feast of Tabernacle that's going to come on the 15th. Uh, But surely, even though it doesn't say it, surely they celebrated the Day of Atonement during this time as well. And time is short, so I'm just going to say a few things um, as we wrap up here. Israel's festivals, all of them, commemorated what God had done for his people in the past. And so as God's people had this annual rhythm of celebrating Passover and celebrating the Day of Atonement and celebrating the Feast of Booths and celebrating the Feasts of Weeks or Pentecost that that will come year after year, they're reenacting what God had done for them in the Exodus to save them and make them his people. They're they're reminding themselves of how God provided for them in the wilderness wanderings. And and they're reminding themselves how they benefited from the fruits of the promised land when he gave them their inheritance. These festivals were pictures of their salvation, pictures of what God had done for them to make him his people and give him their blessings. And in that way, all of them point us forward to our ultimate salvation in Christ. In some way, all of them is a picture of some aspect of the gospel that is fulfilled by Jesus. And and the people throw themselves into celebration of gospel, 
of what God has done for them. And so in this passage, we see identifying and gathering the people of God, listening intently, carefully to his word and celebrating God's works on their behalf. This was the foundation for rebuilding, renewing the people of God at that time. And like the Reformation in the 16th century, and every time God brings renewal to God's people, any time in history, God's word is central. God's word is the means by which God's spirit transforms the hearts of God's people so that we live lives for the glory of God. God's word forms God's people and God's joy The gospel, salvation, what he's done for us is our strength. How will you respond to God's word today? That brings.